Good morning. Welcome to Temple Hill. We are so glad that you're here this morning. If you could please stand and worship with us. All 
together wonderful to me. Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 11 says this, Therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Pastor Andy mentioned this a couple weeks ago about just the encouragement that you are not only to us, but I hopefully to each other as you show up to worship. And I pray that that's your heart's desire this morning, to worship God for who he is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can come into your presence this morning. We're thankful that we're never outside of your presence, but there's something special about just being together as a body, as the church family, to be able to worship you. So Lord, today as we have gathered together, may our distractions, may the thoughts of different things be set aside. May you work in and through us and through your word this morning to accomplish all that you have in store for us. As we look into your word, and your word is truth. And so help us to understand that truth even more today. Lord, we continue to ask that you'd be with those who are struggling physically, that you would bring them through whatever it is they're battling from from smaller colds to, to larger health issues and surgeries and procedures, that you would uh, bring them to a point of good health once again. We pray for those who are struggling maybe with family issues. You'd continue to encourage them, that they'd be able to work things out, that there'd be peace in those homes. Or for those that are struggling in a work environment, You'd provide what's needed for them, that as believers, they would be a good example. They would live underneath maybe the difficulties, but in doing so, they would be a light for you and demonstrate their faith and trust in you, even through the difficult circumstances. And yet, Father, we, we want to come, too, for those that are able to rejoice and have had a blessed week and have many reminders of your faithfulness in our lives, that we want to rejoice and thank you for that as well. And so, Lord, we just ask that in everything that's said and done this morning, that you would receive all the honor, glory, and praise. And we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated, but I'm going to call up all those who are involved in Awana. Come on up front. As they're coming up, there are going to be a couple of songs that they are familiar with. Some of the theme songs they're going to play, and they're going to sing along. And if you know them, feel free to sing along as well. All right, here we go.
want to take a, just a couple minutes in this morning's service just to kind of highlight what's been going on in Awana. And so if I know I called up everyone who's involved with Awana, and all the kids did really well about coming up front, didn't they? You know who didn't? All the adults and leaders. So all of you, get up front, go behind them, stand up here. Uh, this is your opportunity to see who's involved and what's been going on and uh, who's working. See, there's a lot more. It takes a lot of adults to, to do that. Yeah, right. So we're just going to have each of the different uh, group leaders share just briefly what's been going on in their club, kind of how it's been going, and uh, give you a glimpse of what's happening. So where'd Deb go? Did she make it out yet? There you go. Okay. Okay, I was working with Cubbies this year. This was my first year in Awana, and I had some great helpers, Mari Shepherdson, Ethan, and Mrs. Rickard, Karen Rickard stepped in, and it's Susan and uh, Kat Kessler. So um, in Cubbies, we focused on that all are sinners and that Christ died for us. And we finished up the year with learning that we should go and tell that good news to the world. had the privilege of working with these youngsters for, boy, about 25 years now. And we, we have uh, the Sparks, which are kindergarten through second grade kids. And I think this is just the best group because you get to watch these kids discover and learn. And they're learning how to read and, and they're able to conceptualize the, uh, the gospel verses that they're learning. These kids do learn at their own pace. Um, and... Uh, it's, it's pretty leader intensive. And for a few weeks ago, uh, Sue and I were, we were all aboard the COVID train. So we were in quarantine for a while. And uh, Bonnie, where's Bonnie? Right there. And Pastor Bart, thank you too for really stepping up. But this year is kind of a first for us. We have, we have these handsome young men and, and ladies like, uh, like Evan here. And we have Titus Hookwater and Natalie Wood helping out with uh, kids, that, you know, it wasn't that long ago that they were doing these verses themselves, and and now they're they're uh, passing that on, so to speak. So we're grateful for that. So thank you. Hi, <laughs> I'm Doug Warnke. For those of you that don't know me, and uh, this is my first year as the TNT director. Um, the last couple years, I've uh, been a leader of the blue team. Go blue. Um, but uh, I just want to say that these kids have been completely awesome, and all the leaders that uh, have come out to support me and these kids, it's just been great. Uh, this year, um, we've uh, covered the concept of grace, um, which is very important to our salvation. We've, we've gone through uh, where it came from, uh, how it came about, and why, and we've even had some visitors, and we've had... Uh, Joseph uh, showed up to uh, give us a little um, look inside of what grace was for him. Um, and also, we've kind of done some real-world applications for these kids of how they can go out um, in their everyday life and show grace and follow in Jesus' footsteps. So it's been a great year. Um, these kids uh, have been very attentive. And they've also been very giving. Um, back in February, we had our giving month, and we wound up raising over $300 um, to give to a local charity. So that's pretty amazing. So um, I'm very proud of these kids, and um, even despite everything that's gone on, we've had a great year. So thank you. A couple of things you should know. We've had about 75 kids register that they were here at least one week and are on our list but consistently, probably every week, between 45 and 50 of those have been here. And I think about five or so in Cubbies. Sparks is, what, yeah, 15. And TNT's been running close to that 2830. Uh, and so it's been great to have them here. Um, they finished the year Wednesday with awards night and carnival. So they're pretty excited about that, not only to celebrate what they've learned and the accomplishments this year, but also to have some fun after that. And so... Uh, pray for that as we walk through that last week of Awana. So we're excited about that. Now, there were some kids that were going to say some verses, right? Just to give you a glimpse of what they have worked on throughout the year. And so uh, 
Finn, you're going to come up here. I'll stand right by you. Come here, buddy. Mom can do it. There you go. All right. It's not, it's, it's a lot, Finn, it's a lot different standing up here, not just with three people, but with all these people, right? You want to try it or not? No? All right. TNT ears right up here. I know you're ready. Let's go. Are you ready? All right, you got to say it loud. Amen. Give him a round of applause. All right? Good work. All right. You may have a seat. Thank you for being up here. Just real quick, a couple of announcements for the rest of the crowd there. Um, again, we're glad you're here. Just real quick, a couple of announcements. You heard last week uh, that there's a women's choir getting prepped and ready to do a special number on Mother's Day. So if you haven't already been contacted by Judy Nichols over here at the piano, um, see her if you would like to sing. Love to have many of you participate in that. Also, volunteers, and you just saw all the adults that helped with Awana. That's one ministry in our church. But there are a number of other things that many of you, a lot of you, participate in in helping from week to week or month to month or maybe once or twice a year. Uh, volunteer Banquet is coming up on May 5th. We would love to have you join us for that. It's an opportunity for us to recognize you and just thank you for your service, however small you think it might be. We would love to have you come and be a part of that with us. So there's either a check off there on the connection card in the bulletin or a sign up sheet on the table out back right outside the auditorium doors. Again, if you take those connection cards, fill those out, especially if you're new with us, we'd love to have some contact info for you. We won't robocall you. We don't give it out to other people just so we have a way to contact you and reach out to you if we need to as well. And then uh, this morning, right after the service, a few minutes, connect time. Just an opportunity to share together what we've been reading through together. Uh, how many of you continuing to read through? I know, show of hands, asking, all right? Um, it's always interesting. I'll share a glimpse, and then you come share more after the service. But reading through Matthew 10 through 14 this week and read the familiar account of Peter walking on the water. And we often think of that and think, oh, yep, it's Peter and how courageous he was and then maybe sometimes we give him a hard time because well he's on the water and then he sank like why would he do that and yet I always think okay but the other disciples were still in the boat but one of the things that stood out to me and and shared this with chapel students at Heritage Christian on Friday it was interesting to me that in the midst of the storm Jesus's presence at that moment didn't calm the disciples what did they say it's a uh, Go. You know what calmed the disciples? When Jesus spoke. His word. And, and I know for many of us, we go through life and there's all kinds of storms and struggles as well. And, and I want to encourage you that, you know what, God has given us and he speaks to us in his word. And I pray that that would be a, an encouragement and a comfort to you as well. So just one of the things that we have the opportunity to talk about, like, oh, I never saw that before in, in those reading uh, again, so I encourage you to join that and then also uh, the D group with Jim Johnson will meet in here. As they continue to study the book of Revelation. So let me encourage you to stand as we continue to worship our great Savior this morning. Here I raise my 
still stands. And so, Father, we can say with confidence, great is your faithfulness. Lord, as we think of your word, we think of the promise that you will never leave us, that you will never forsake us. Lord, we are still held in the palm of your hands. And so, God, this morning, we rejoice, no matter what storms we may be facing in our life, that we can truly say with confidence, great is your faithfulness. Lord, encourage our hearts as we remember that word, as we remember that promise that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Children in Club 631, fifth grade on down, may be dismissed at this time to their classes. Well, the last couple weeks, we've been trying to clear up some of the confusion about the church. We've been talking about what the church is, and we've been talking about what the church does. We said that the church really is a group of people who gather to assemble and who meet with God. And what the church does, what our business, what our mission is, is discipleship. It's to disciple others, and it's to be discipled ourselves. And so the next logical question that we have to ask ourselves is this. Are we all in? Are we completely committed to the church, to the mission that God has given to us? As a part of the body of Christ, are we actively doing our part to accomplish what God has called us to do? You know, in our culture, there are many examples of people who are all in. You know, I remember uh, when I was the youth pastor here, we used to do this thing called Nerf Wars here. And I'm not like really serious, really big into it. But I remember these teenagers showing up, you know, and they've got all these equipment. They've got these huge Nerf weapons. They've got like 5,000 rounds of their little rubber soft foam Nerf bullets. They've got shields. They're decked out in camouflage. Man, they were all in for this activity, for this excitement. And it's not just kids who are all in, right? It's adults. We see adults who are 
all in for various causes, for various missions. We see adults who are all in on sports and, and other things. It used to be before the pandemic, right? You could go to a stadium and you'd see thousands of people all gathered there and there'd be people with chest painted and fate painted. They'd be wearing jerseys. They'd know all the stats and the numbers and names of players. They were completely all in for that cause, for that mission, for whatever it is that they were engaged in. And when we come to the church, when we come to the body of Christ, we have to ask ourselves that same question, am I all in? If this is what the church is, if this is what the church does, am I sold out for Jesus Christ? And if so, how would we know? Well, there's a number of indicators that we could point to that would help us to identify that. But one of the main indicators I think that God gives to us is this idea of church membership. And yet in our culture today, we see that church membership is on the decline, that there are many Bible-believing, God-fearing Christians who have not committed to join a church. And the question we need to ask ourselves is why not? Well, as a pastor for the last 13 years, I've been able to identify several reasons why people don't join, but really all those reasons kind of boil down into three main reasons. One of the first reasons is people don't have a proper understanding, a biblical understanding of what church membership is and what church membership means. There's a lot of confusion about what church membership is. And so if you don't have a biblical understanding of what church membership is, it would make sense that you don't feel the need or you don't see the importance of why you need to join a church. Another reason is that there's simply a lack of trust in any kind of authority or institution today. Historians, uh, people who study uh, history, people who study mankind would attribute that lack of trust going back to the Nixon administration with that scandal. And we've seen it growing just uh, exponentially here these days. And then I think the third reason why people fail to join is there's really a fear of commitment. Oftentimes I hear people say to me as we talk about church membership, you know, that if I join, the church is going to ask me to do more, and I don't want to do more. One of the uh, people who joined our church in the last few years came up to me after they joined and said, one of the reasons that I waited for so long to join was simply because I was afraid if I was asked to do something as a member, I'd have to say yes. I couldn't say no. And if that were true... I could understand why there was a fear of commitment. But we see this fear of commitment in our culture all over the place. You know, teenagers, when they're signing up for an activity, they want to know who's coming. All right? Even adults now, we put these sign-up sheets, we announce stuff for you know, six to eight weeks out, and when does everybody sign up? The last week. And there's that fear of commitment a little bit. Who's coming? What's going to change? Do I really want to be a part of this? And so this morning, as we talk about church membership, I just want to help clear up some of the confusion that exists out there. I want to share with you what the Bible teaches, and we'll really try and answer two questions for you in the next few hours. Question number one, none of you balked at that. All right, good, I got two hours. We're going to cover this. <laughs> All right, number one, is church membership biblical? Is it really in the Bible? And number two, is church membership important? And so those are the two questions that we want to ask and answer here this morning. So I invite you, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. If you're following along in a pew Bible, you can find it on page 920 in that pew Bible there. Now this is a familiar passage to many of us. As we start reading, you'll recognize some of the verses there. And it's not often used in the context of church membership. And yet as we work through it, hopefully you'll see that it's a beautiful description of what church membership ought to be and church membership ought to look like. And I do want to give one disclaimer here as well. This morning, I'm not going to be preaching the main point of the text because Paul is not writing this simply to say, you should be a church member. That's not why he's writing Romans chapter 12. And yet, as we go through it, there are going to be several principles that apply to church membership that I want to talk about here this morning. And so we're going to refer to the text a lot. We're going to jump around a bit, so be prepared to move in your Bibles. But we'll start in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. 
Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and to approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Father God, as we approach your word here this morning, I pray that you would speak. Lord, sometimes it's easy when we do topical messages to share our opinions to share our thoughts. But God, I pray today that you would help me to only share what your word says and that Jesus Christ might be seen clearly and might be honored and magnified in all that is said and done in our time together. Lord Jesus, we love you and we ask these things in your name. Amen. Before we dive into the text this morning, I think it would be helpful for me to define for you what church membership is. It's important that we're all on the same page when we talk about this concept. And I'm going to take a definition from this helpful little book by Nine Marks. It's called Church Membership by Jonathan Lehman. It's an excellent resource. So if you have questions, if you want to know more about church membership when we're done, I encourage you to read this book. But here's the definition he gives of church membership. I put it in your notes there on the back of the bulletin. He says, church membership is a formal relationship between a church and a Christian, characterized by the church's affirmation and oversight of a Christian's discipleship and the Christian's submission to living out his or her discipleship in the care of the church. That's quite a lengthy definition, a little bit chunky, and so let me break it down into a couple parts. He starts out by saying that church membership is a formal relationship between a church and a Christian. In other words, what he's saying is a church body formally, uh, formally excuse me, affirms an individual's profession of faith and baptism as credible. In other words, we give our stamp of approval that this person really is a child of God. You know, credibility is something that's really important in our day and age. When somebody's writing a book like this one, we want to know why are they credible? How do we know we can trust what they say? Why should we read this book? How do we know this guy even knows what he's talking about? And so in the process of writing a book, they send a manuscript out to all kinds of different people. And they have those people read it, and they have those people write reviews. They have people endorse it. So this book, for instance, was endorsed by Tim Keller, Mark Dever, and Thomas Schreiner, seminary professors, pastors who are well-respected in the Baptist community. Credibility is important, and it's the same way in the church. In a watching world, how awesome it is to have a group of people who have our back and say that person is a child of God. We've heard their testimony. We've seen the way that they live. We've seen the way that they reflect Christ. In all that they do, that person is a child of God. Well, secondly, as part of that definition, he says that the church, as part of church membership, promises to give oversight to a Christian's discipleship. In other words, our job as a church is to do exactly what we talked about last week. It's to disciple others. It's to train and equip you to do the work of the ministry, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4. And then that definition also says that the individual formally submits his or her discipleship to the service and authority of this body of believers. See, your relationship with Jesus Christ, as personal in nature as it is, is always meant to be lived out in the context of community. It's meant to be have oversight. It's meant to have affirmation, and so the church comes in, and they provide that affirmation and oversight to your faith. They provide a sense of protection, as we'll talk about here coming up. In other words, church membership really is all about a church's responsibility to you and your responsibility to the church. It really works both ways. It's not a one-sided commitment. It's not just what you get out of it but it's about what you contribute as well. And that's what makes church membership so unique from any other kind of membership. You want to join the golf club? 
You have to get a membership. And at that golf club, you're going to get all kinds of, here's your perks, here's your benefits that you get because you joined that. But you're not really obligated to give. I mean, yeah, you have to pay for that. So you give them some money for that. But you're not really obligated. You don't really have any sense of commitment to that. And the same is true with other things. But in a church, the main thing church membership does is it express a commitment to the body of believers. It's about our commitment to one another. And we'll see that as we go along. So question number one we need to answer, is church membership biblical? The number one objection I hear to church membership is this, is that it's not in the Bible. And to an extent, to an extent, I would agree with you. Here's what I mean. You can't chapter and verse it. You can't go to the back of your Bible, look up church membership, and see a proof text that has the words church membership in it and why we should do it. And yet I would argue that church membership is written all over the New Testament. How can I say that? Well, first of all, I would argue that the entire New Testament is about being in Christ and being in church. From the book of Acts, where the church was formed, all the way through Revelation, those two key themes continually emerge. Being in Christ and being in the church. The Pauline epistles are an excellent example of that. But furthermore, I would go on to add this. Who are the New Testament letters, the books of the Bible, written to? The vast majority of them are not written to individual Christians. There are a few, but the majority of them are written to who? The church. To us, Romans, which we just read, was written specifically to the church in Rome, to a specific body of believers. And you can go throughout the entire New Testament and identify which church that book of the Bible was written to. For those that weren't specifically written to a church, like the Gospels, most of them include this idea of what a church is and how it ought to function, how we ought to relate to one another as the church. And so that's why we can say the entire New Testament really speaks about and emphasizes this idea of church membership. Pastor Alistair Beggs, uh, Begg, excuse me, in his sermon, would uh, go so far as to say that if you're not in church, you're either not in Christ or you're confused about what it means to be in Christ. And at the very least, we could say there's a faulty connection somewhere. We can also say and remind ourselves that God has instituted the church and that he is the head of the church. That God has brought this church into existence. Got some verses that will appear up on the screen that I want you to follow along with me. The first is Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. It says, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And so we learn here that this idea of the church, it was really in God's mind. It was God's plan. He created it. He instituted it. And it's God's responsibility to build his church. How does he do that? By bringing other people together to confess the exact same thing that Peter confessed. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And those people who have made that confession are the people who make up the church. Moving on, we can go to Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 and see how God created this church. Paul tells us there, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God which he bought with his own blood. God created the church and it was so significant to him, the way he created it was through the shed blood of his very own son, Jesus Christ. And then Colossians chapter 1 verse 18, which we've been memorizing together, and he is the head of the body, the church. That because Christ created the church, because Christ died, shed his blood to form the church, he is the rightful head of the church. And so we need to ask ourselves some questions. Why would God go to such great lengths to establish and create the church with the shed blood of his own son, Jesus Christ, if it were an optional thing to do? If it were optional to be a part of? If it were optional to attend? If it were optional to join? It would almost be like God was saying, the church is so valuable that it cost me the life of my son, and yet the church is so invaluable that you don't really have to be a part of it. Hey, come if you want, join if you want, show up once in a while, but really not that big a deal. That would be really counterintuitive for God to do that and say that. See, the church means a great deal to God, and it ought to mean a great deal to us, because the church is God's means of working in the world today. 
In fact, it's so important to God that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be the head of the church that no one else would do, that no one else could be trusted to not mess this thing up. And so Jesus Christ, as the head of the church, has the right to then dictate what goes on here, and he does that through his word. One of the things he dictates is that we, as followers of Jesus Christ, are a part of this church, not just because we show up and attend, but because we commit to it. It's who we are as followers of Jesus. And this half-hearted commitment simply will not do. We are all in simply because of we are followers of Jesus Christ. That is who we are. However, if we were honest, many people don't view the church this way in our society today. And so I would argue that part of the reason that we have a formal membership process is because people have rejected God's instruction. People have rejected God's command to wholeheartedly commit to the church, to the bride of Christ. So we need to know who's all in. We also see in the New Testament a very specific pattern when it comes to church membership. And the pattern goes a little something like this. Saved, baptized, added, and involved. I want you to flip over to Acts chapter 2 with me. We want to see this pattern in person. Acts chapter 2. This is the birth of the church. If you remember on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit has come down. He's indwelt the disciples and the crowd, they look on and they're like, these guys are drunk. And Peter gets up and he stands up and says, hey, it's 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning. We're not drunk. Here's what's going on. And he preaches this sermon to them. And here's how the people respond in Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 47. Those who accepted his message, we could use that word believe there for accepted, those who believed his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day... They continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And so we have this pattern. They were saved. They believed the message. They got baptized. They were added to the church, and then they were involved. But it wasn't just the first church where this pattern takes place. In Acts chapter 5, if we were to skip ahead, we would see this same pattern, that they they believed, that they were added to the church, and then they went about the work of bringing other people to Jesus. They were involved in the work of the ministry. In Acts chapter 6, the first problem arises in the church. There's conflict. There's tension. And as they resolve this tension and this conflict in a biblical way, it says that uh, people believed that they were added to the church and they became involved in being a part of the solution to solve that problem. In Acts chapter 8, 26 through 40, we have the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip preaches to this man, he explains the word of God to him, and he believes, and he's baptized, and there was no church for him to go back to in Ethiopia, so what does he do? He says, there's no church to be added to, so I'm going to start a church, and we find traces later in the New Testament of the gospel in Ethiopia because of this, saved, baptized, added, and involved. In Acts chapter 9, we see Saul converted, and we see Saul believe. He's baptized, he's added to the church, he meets with the disciples, and then he's involved in the work of the ministry. In Acts chapter 11, when the Gentiles first are introduced to the gospel of Jesus Christ, they believe, they get baptized, they're added to the record of the church, and they are involved in the work of the ministry. We see that throughout the book of Acts. This is the pattern that God has given to us. Believe, baptized, added, Involved, And this is a pattern I would argue that we see in Romans chapter 12, right? We believe based on the mercies of God. And as part of presenting our bodies a living sacrifice, we are baptized. And then we are added to the church and we are involved in the work of the ministry through the spiritual gifts that God gives to us to use. And so we could really say this, church membership is our response based on God's saving work and him making us a part of of the church. That if we are a follower of Jesus Christ, friends, this is where we belong. One of the things that pains my heart as a pastor is to hear stories of people who don't feel like they belong 
to a church. And I was talking with a, a member this week who brought someone to church who didn't feel like they were uh, belong. They didn't feel like they were a part of the church here. That was a very hard thing for them to work through. We need to make sure that we carry out our vision of a family for you. Because as followers of Christ, this is where Christians belong. But belonging isn't just on us. Belonging also has individual responsibility as well. There have been people who have left the church down throughout the years who said, I don't feel like I belong. But as you look at their history, they didn't show up very often. They didn't participate in the life of the church. It's no wonder they didn't feel like they belonged because when we gathered, they weren't here. And so this sense of belonging, this sense of responsibility really goes both ways. We have a responsibility to help people feel like they belong, but you also have a responsibility to belong by being here, by participating in the life of the church. Let me offer one final argument for church membership being a biblical concept, and it would be this. All the New Testament metaphors for the church only make sense as we join together in membership. We looked at three of these metaphors a few weeks ago. We talked about the church being an embassy, that we're ambassadors of Jesus Christ. We talked about the church being a temple, and we talked about the church being a body. But the New Testament has a lot of other examples about what the church is. It's a household. It's a building. right? It's a, a family. It's a bride of Christ. These don't make sense if we're only loosely connected together. These don't make sense if there's no commitment to one another. If I don't make a commitment to you and you don't make a commitment to me, how are we a family? How are we a household or a building or a body? Well, the reality is we're not if we don't have that kind of commitment. We're just a group of random individuals who are in a similar space, independent of one another. And that is a far cry from what God intended the church to be. And so the New Testament metaphors for the church only make sense in the context of church membership. When we have that type of commitment to one another. Now, as I hear all that, I can hear some of the objections. I can hear people saying, well, Pastor Andy, all that evidence doesn't conclusively prove that church membership is biblical. Okay, maybe not, but hopefully you can see the traces of it in the New Testament, that the concept is there. Our formal process of church membership may look different than it did in the early church, but we know they had a process. We know that people were added to the church. We know that they kept lists and records of people who were there. How else would we know the number? 3,000, 5,000. As we talk about in 1 Timothy, we talk about there's a list of widows. They had names. They kept records. They knew. And so church membership, at the very least we can say, is in the Bible in some way, shape, or form. That doesn't mean the way we do it here at Temple Hill Baptist Church is the exact right way to do it. It's the exact way the apostles first did it but we can at least follow a little bit of a a prescription when it comes to that. Well, the second question we want to talk about is this. Is church membership important? If we agree that church membership is biblical, then we're obviously going to agree that it's important. But if we say, I'm not convinced it's really biblical, I'm not convinced it's in the Bible, I think we can still make the argument from Scripture that church membership is important. How so? And I want to give you four reasons real quickly why church membership is important. Reason number one. Membership is important because membership equals identity. Paul starts out Romans chapter 12 saying this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercies, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. See, as followers of Jesus, it's important for us to know who is in the family. I want you to think about it this way. After church, I'm going to drive home. Some of you guys know where I live. I live in a subdivision there around Stone Ledge Lake. And I go to uh, my neighborhood, and it's a nice day, so I roll the windows down, and I call out to people, and I say, Children, come to Daddy. It's time for lunch. At that moment, it's very important to know who is in your family. It's very important to know who your daddy is, and it's very important to know who your kids are. I don't want to pick up any kids that aren't mine. Otherwise, the police will be picking me up. We don't want to have that happen. But more than that, right, I only have a responsibility to my kids. I don't have a responsibility to feed the neighborhood and tell them it's time for lunch. The only people I have responsibility for are the Brubaker children. They bear my name, and I know that they're in my family. And friends, in the same way, that's how it works here in the church. We need to know who belongs here at Temple Hill Baptist Church. How do we do that? Well, we take the name. 
We take the name first as a follower of Jesus Christ by confessing him as Lord of our life, but we also take the name of Temple Hill Baptist Church, that I belong here. We know who's in the family. That we confess that that we belong through our confession of Jesus Christ as Lord, and then we show that we belong by being baptized and identifying with Christ through that work, and then committing to the local church. And because you do that, then we are responsible for your growth and your relationship with Jesus Christ. Now we need to ask ourselves, can that happen apart from church membership? Can people just come and can people show up? And I would say yes and no. Right, You can show up. You can attend. We certainly want to give everyone a taste of what it means to be a family for you. But apart from being a member, you cannot truly experience what it means to be a family for you. Think about it this way. Some of you have children or some of you have friends. Those are good things to have. You may invite them over to your house for a meal. And as part of that meal, they come, they fellowship with you, but they are not a part of your family. They didn't help select the food you're going to have that day. They didn't buy the food. They didn't help you cook the food. They may help you clean up in a sense, but they're not required to, nor are they expected to. The conversation that you might have around the dinner dinner table may in some way relate to them, but in a lot of ways, it's going to be about your family. It's going to be in that context, and at the end of the day, eventually, they're going to leave and go home whether by choice or whether you kick them out, because they don't belong to your family. And friends, in the same way, just like attending and not joining, it's kind of like being that friend over for dinner. You get a taste of what it's like, but it's not the real thing. The two aren't the same, and the problem comes when we try and treat attending but not joining the same as church membership. Here's what I mean. When we treat attending like the same thing as membership, we make everything so vague and so broad that anybody can join, anybody can be a part, and all of a sudden there is no real distinction. And yet the New Testament is clear, there ought to be some kind of distinction. We know that as followers of Christ, there's a distinction that we are the salt of the earth, right? That we are the light of the world. We are separate. We are distinct. In Romans 12, 2, right, we're not to be conformed to the pattern of this world, but we're to be transformed. We're to be different. There is to be some kind of distinction simply based on the fact that we are a child of God. But I think it goes further and carries into the life of the church as well. You know, Jesus, when he's talking about salvation, when he's talking about coming to be a part of the family, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That is an exclusive call. So why is Jesus so exclusive? What is the point of this exclusiveness that comes with being a follower of Jesus Christ? The point is, we need to know who is in the family and who isn't. Not that all aren't welcome to attend, certainly they are. We want people to come, we want people to hear about Jesus and put their faith and trust in him. We want people who have that relationship with Christ to come and learn about how they can have a better relationship with him. And yet the goal is always connection. The goal is always to be added, to be involved as we commit to them and as they commit to us. You know, think about our discipleship pathway. We have it painted on the back wall there. Our discipleship pathway is encounter, encourage, empower, enlist, and engage. It's a pattern. It's almost like the New Testament pattern of uh, saved, baptized, added, and involved. It's kind of like we planned it that way, right? That membership equals our identity, that this is who we are. This is what we do. i give you one more illustration of that. I mentioned the, the arena and the basketball theme. It's almost playoff time for, for the NBA right now, but normally you'd see people in the fans with, with jer- in the stands with uh, jerseys on, you know, they're sold out for their team. But as much as they look like they're a part of the team, as much as they look like they're all in, they're still not a part of the team. When a coach calls a timeout, he's not going to look up in the stands, see a guy wearing a jersey and saying, hey, what play should we run? When a player gets tired, he's not going to look around the stands, find some guy wearing a jersey and say, hey, come on down, fill in for me. They're not going to do it. As much as they look like they're a part of the team, they're still not a part of the team. And friends, it's the same way in the church. You can look like you're a part of the team, but it's not the same as being on the team. Membership equals identity. Well, secondly, membership is important because membership equals protection. 
Membership equals protection. Why did the early church keep a record of those who belonged to them? Well, there could be a number of reasons. One of the reasons was, in those days, the church was heavily persecuted. When you joined the church, you were literally laying everything down on the line. To be a follower of Christ meant that you could be killed. They didn't have to have such a formal membership process. Membership for them equaled protection. They needed to know who was in the family. That close-knit circle of people protected them. And when you faced persecution, when you lost your job, when you were kicked out of your home, when you were driven from your uh, city that you lived in because of your faith in Jesus Christ, these other Christians, the church as a whole was going to come around and provide and care and protect you because that's what a church does. But it wasn't just for physical protection. It was for spiritual protection as well. I think I have Acts 20, 29 through 31 up on the screen for you. It says this. Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus, and he says, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. Waiting for the PowerPoint to catch up, but that's all right. Here it goes. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with Tears. See, Paul understands that false teachers are going to come in. And he says some are even going to come from within your own number. Now, our job as the church is to hopefully protect you from that false teaching. Not that we're going to stop every case of false teaching in the church, but it's part of our screening process. It's why we only want members teaching here at THVC. Right? We want people who have we know and have identified and said, this is a follower of Jesus. We want people who we know agree with our doctrinal statement and have had a chance to live that out in front of us to show that they really believe it. Those are the kinds of people we want teaching. Why? As protection. To protect us from false doctrine. Again, not that we'll catch every case, but hopefully we'll prevent many of the cases of spiritual infection. Membership is for our protection. Well, third, membership is important because membership equals accountability. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, that we belong to each other. Let's read that again, Romans 12, verses 4 and 5. He says, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have all the same functions, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So what does it mean to belong to one another? I want you to think about it in a marriage relationship. The language given in the scriptures is that when you're married, the two become one flesh. And church membership is often like a marriage. There's a high level of commitment and a high level of accountability. We submit to one another. And Paul says here, we literally become one body. We become one flesh. We belong to one another. Writer of Hebrews said this because we belong together in Hebrews chapter 3 verses 12 and 13. Again, it's up on the screen so you can follow along. It says, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. It goes on to say, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Since we belong to one another, we have a responsibility to one another. The writer of Hebrews says, see to it, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart. This means it's our job, it's our responsibility to one another to make sure that we stay on track. This means we have permission to ask questions. This means we have permission to share observations when you're not living how we believe the Bible says you ought to live as a child of God. It's not so that we can know the dirt on everybody else. It's not so that we can say, see, I'm really better than you. It's so that we can help and encourage one another in their walk with Jesus Christ. We belong to one another and we have a responsibility to one another. After all, we're prone to wander as we sung about this morning, right? We're prone to leave the God that we love and we're tempted to do this every single day in many ways, shapes, and forms. And so we need one another to help us stay true to Jesus Christ. You know, we looked at Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 last week that we have this responsibility to spur one another on to love and to good works, that we have a responsibility to encourage one another all the more as we see the day approaching. That's what happens when we belong to one another. 
It's that discipling piece that Pastor Bart spoke about last week. But it only happens when we realize that I have a commitment and responsibility to you, and you have a commitment and responsibility to me. And a lot of times we think this works from the top down. We think like leadership has a responsibility for everyone else. And certainly that's true, but you guys have responsibility for me as a pastor to see to it that I don't develop a sinful, unbelieving heart. I need you to ask questions. I need you to invest in my life because I am just as prone to wander as the rest of you. I may be up on a platform, but I am not spiritually up on a platform. I am one of you. We are committed to one another, and we need each other. To give you an example of that, the teens were talking about encouragement on Sunday night, and each of the pastors got some encouragement notes. And and some of them were real general and just, hey, thanks for being our pastor or something like that. But, But there was one I got that was really specific. I won't share the name of who it was, but it said, Pastor Andy... Thank you for preaching and teaching me more about the gospel. You always make it really clear and easy to understand. Thanks for being a great preacher and pastor. That teenager may or may not have understood what they were doing, but they were practicing this commitment that they had to me. To see to it that I don't develop a sinful, unbelieving heart. And that's what the body of Christ ought to be doing for one another. But again, if you haven't committed to me and I haven't committed to you, it's awfully hard to do. I can't hold you and you can't hold me to a standard that we haven't agreed to. We have a standard. We have a doctrinal statement that I think is pretty clear. We have a church covenant that we expect us to follow as a congregation that the scripture teaches. This is how we treat one another. If you haven't agreed to that standard, I can't hold you responsible to it. Sure, I can hold you to God's word and say you claim to be a follower of God. And so here's what God's word says we ought to live like. But I specifically can't hold you to that standard if you haven't committed to me and I haven't committed to you. Membership equals accountability. And then lastly, membership equals dependability. Or you could say teamwork. For those of you who like acronyms, I chose dependability because it spells iPad, so it's a way for you to remember it, right? Identity, protection, accountability, and dependability. So teamwork probably was the better word, but I did that one for your benefit there. But Paul goes on in Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, and he talks about spiritual gifting. He talks about the way that we ought to use our gifts to minister to one another. And in Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 16, he elaborates on that even more. He says that God has given us gifts specifically for the building up of the body until we all attain to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We are working together for that goal and for that mission. So by becoming a church member, you are committed to using your gifts to help me, to help the rest of the church to reach the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And it also means that I can't do it, I can't attain to this measure without you using your gifts. That's the implication here in Ephesians chapter 4. Let me give you one more illustration to help you understand this idea of dependability. Some of you grew up going to, to camps and you did some of those fun team builder activities that we all know and love. There was one where you had three trees. It was kind of a, a triangle and you had a rope from this tree and, the, and this tree. And so it was going like this in a triangle. It was farther apart on one end. It was close together. And so you'd start on the end that was close together. And you'd start, you'd have your hands locked. And at first it wasn't really hard to like stay connected, to stay up on the wire. It was usually about knee height off the ground. But as you got farther and farther apart, you had to depend on one another more and more in order so that you did not fall. And the same is true in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Man, we need to depend on each other like that so that we do not fall. Now typically we think, you know, as a Christian, yeah, I start way out here, I'm really dependent, but then as I learn the scriptures, I grow on my own and I don't need people as much anymore. That's not true. Right? We all stay out here all the time. We're completely dependent on one another. That's what the scripture teaches. And that's why Paul can say in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26, you know, if one member suffers, we all suffer. If somebody's struggling to help hold us up, we all suffer. That's why he can say in Romans chapter 12 that we weep with those who weep and we rejoice with those who rejoice because we are vitally connected to one another through this process of church membership. I want to make one more observation as we bring our time to a close here. Have you noticed that all these points really have nothing to do with the benefits 
of church membership. None of them were about, hey, sign up and here's what you get. See, all of these were about our commitment to one another. Yes, we receive the benefits of that. Yes, we get an identity. Yes, we receive protection. Yes, we receive accountability. Yes, we receive dependability and teamwork. But we contribute just as much to the rest of the body to make those things sure those things are happening here. See, the reality of being a church member, friends, is that it's not about you. It is about our commitment to Jesus Christ and our commitment to one another. We join first and foremost to show that we commit to one another. And so what are we saying by possibly not joining the church? We could possibly be saying a couple different things. Number one, we could be saying, I'm simply not a follower of Jesus yet. Again, that's okay. We want you here. We want you to hear the gospel and to believe and to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. You could also be saying, you know what, I just don't really need you guys that much in my relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, I I can grow in, in him on my own. Or we could be saying that I simply don't love you enough yet to fully commit to you. Again, take the idea of living together in marriage. Living together is not the same as marriage. What's the difference? Commitment. And the same is true in the process of church membership. I don't think anyone intends to communicate those things. I want to make that clear. I don't think anyone's intentionally going around saying, hey, I don't join because I don't love you enough to fully commit. I don't think anybody does that. But it can be perceived that way when we understand the importance of church membership, what it means according to the scriptures. Attending a church but not joining is, again, not the same as being a member. There is a difference, and that main difference is our commitment to one another. Now, some of you may argue, Pastor Andy, look, I'm here every week. I'm involved in ministries. I'm committed. I'm sold out for Jesus Christ. And I would 100% agree with that statement. And so you might say, well, why join then? What's the point? I would just flip the question around to you. Why not join? Right? What have you got to lose? If it's not going to change your level of commitment, if it's not going to change your level of involvement, then why not say, hey, I'm all in. Why not make a public declaration that I'm here, committed to you, that I'm working for the good of the body of Christ? Why would, be, we, why would we be ashamed to say that? You know, I appreciate Brother Dan Peterson, Dan and Dolores became uh, members not too long ago, and they've been here for a long time. Dan and Dolores are those people who you would say, man, they're sold out, they're here, they're attending, they're faithfully involved in ministries. But I asked Dan, Dan, why do you want to become a member? And his answer, I want to become a member in order to show my commitment to the rest of the church. He got it. He understood church membership isn't about him. It's not about the right to vote. It's not about getting on a leadership committee that comes with being a member For him, it was about commitment to one another. And he wanted to say loud and clear, I'm committed to the rest of you. Praise God. See, the reality is the only thing not joining gives you is the ability to walk away easier. Now, it shouldn't because we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And anytime somebody walks away, it's messy. It hurts. It shouldn't make it easier, but it does. When I have a disagreement with church leadership, it's easy for me to pack up and walk away because I'm not committed. I'm not really tied to that. It's one less thing that I have to break. When there's a relational conflict with other people in the church, you know what? I can go somewhere else and find another body of, uh, of Christ who believe the same way or similarly to I do, and I can, I can go there, and it'll be okay. I won't miss a thing. But commitment says, when I have a disagreement with leadership, I'm going to work for the good of the body. Commitment says, when I have a relational conflict with somebody else, I'm going to work for the good of that relationship and the good of the body. That's the difference that commitment makes in our lives. That's why Paul goes on to say in Romans chapter 12, verse 10, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. That's why the rest of Romans chapter 12 is all about, here's how we treat each other and live like the church that God intended us to be. So let me ask you these questions by way of application here this morning. Number one, are you here today and are you in Christ? Do you have that relationship with Jesus? See, we become in Christ when we understand that God created us to have a relationship with Him. And we realize that our sin separates us from God. 
that we rebelled, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And when we understand that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When we realize that our sin can't be removed by good deeds, I can't be a good enough person, there is nothing I can do to earn God's favor. The only person who can take care of my sin problem is the one I sinned against, God himself. Well, God, because he loved us, God, because he still wants to have that relationship with us, sent his son Jesus to come to this earth and die on the cross for our sin so that if we will put our faith and trust in him, we too can have eternal life. And we are guaranteed that eternal life through the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, from the dead. Do you have that relationship with Jesus? Are you in Christ? Secondly, I would ask you this. Are you in church? Are you a church member? And if the answer is no, I would simply ask you again, why not? What's keeping you from making that commitment? I understand that we're not always going to agree on every little point. That's okay. We're a first group of people. That's part of what makes this church so amazing. But it's coming together even in the midst of our diversity that shows all men that we are Christ's disciples, right? By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And so this morning, would you commit to this process of church membership to show that you are committed to the body of Christ and committed to one another. Third, if you are a church member, let me ask you this. Are you modeling what it means to be a good church member? Are you modeling that sense of identity and protection and accountability and dependability? I think one of the reasons church membership on, is on the decline is because we've done a terrible job as a church, not just our church, but the church as a whole, universal, at teaching and modeling the importance of church membership. That's part of the discipleship process that we need to talk about and we need to pass on to other people. Are you modeling what it means to be a good church member? And then lastly, I would say this. There are a number of you here who are excellent church members. There are a number of you here who you've had your disagreements, you've had your relational conflicts, and yet you've said, I am committed to this body. I'm committed to working out those differences for the sake and the cause of Jesus Christ. Can I just say to those of you who fit that description, thank you. Man, we need your example. We have so much more to learn from you and what it means to be a church member. Keep it up. Or bottom line this morning, if we can sum up everything, I think we can make a really simple statement as a bottom line. And that bottom line is this. Being a church member is important because it's not about you. It's about the good of others. Hopefully you've seen that as we talked about that here today. This is what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. This is why it's so special. This is why it's so important. When we're away from this place, it feels like we're truly away from family because we have that level of commitment to one another. So based on the, this, what the scripture teaches, again, I just challenge you in that area again. As you look at your membership, whether you're a member or not, are you working for the good of others? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that your word speaks to us about all the issues of life. Lord, we know that you don't address everything directly. It would be a much longer book if you did. We know that you give us patterns and principles and precepts from your word so that we can live exactly how you've called us to live. God, I pray again as we talked about this area of church membership today. Lord, I pray that people would be convinced of the importance of it. Lord, that you created this church, that you shed your blood to bring us into this family. And that, God, we would put aside our differences. And that we would commit to one another for the sake of the gospel. God, may you use us here at Temple Hill Baptist Church to be a shining beacon of what you intended the church to be and what you intended the church to accomplish. May you use us to just work out your mission in great and mighty ways in this community so that all may see and know that you are God and so that many will put their faith and trust in you. God, give us a burden for the church and give us a heart for the lost. God, today I pray as well that you would just remind us of who you say we are. That as part of being a child of God, 
we can confidently say, I am a church member. And we don't say that arrogantly, but we do say it proudly in the sense of ownership, that you have given this privilege and this responsibility to us, and we may, be, may we be faithful to live in light of that commitment each and every day. Lord Jesus, we love you. And we pray these things in your precious name. Amen. Please stand and worship with us. sing that like you really believe it and that you know what it means to be a child of God. If you have more questions again about church membership and what that means, I'd love to talk with you. Pastor Bart, Brent, the same thing. Come find us. We'd love to chat more with you about that process and how you can become even more committed here at Temple Hill Baptist Church. Again, we want to invite you to stick around for Sunday Connect. We've got some goodies over there in the fellowship hall, a chance to talk about what we're learning throughout the week in our Bible reading and encourage you to stick around as Jim Johnson continues to discuss the book of Revelations and uh, Revelation and teach us through that here today. You're dismissed.
dreams of mercy never cease. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melody sonnet, sung by flaming tongues of love. Praise I bound, I fixed upon. Here's my own. 